Hi, good evening, everybody, and welcome to Farmers Travels. Well, tonight I've got a very special guest, our own Roman Kabanak, who has indulged himself in some politics, and lately he's been providing us with some current and fresh news on Morning Shot. So if you're on the stream, you haven't subscribed to Morning Shot, guys, please subscribe to Morning Shot. And please be as kind to me on tonight with the zapper as you are with him on his zapper. Uh, Ramon, thank you for coming on to the channel. We're not talking politics tonight, but we'll be talking a bit about your travel experience. And uh, yeah, please tell us how many countries have you visited and I'm going to leave it open to you tonight to talk a bit about your travel experiences. Um, and then later on, I'll do the King of the Hill um, Q&A with you. Okay. Well, Hanon, firstly, thank you for inviting me onto your show. Uh, deeply, deeply appreciated. And secondly, your intro video, my friend, that's a work of art. It's much better than mine. <laughs> mine looks like a... A preschool project compared to that. Very nice. Um, if I had to calculate how many countries I've been to, it's difficult to tell. I would argue uh, 12. So a bit of an amateur uh, compared to my host. But uh, the, the reason being is I'm from France, so I sort of have to go there to see family. So instead of having a choice in the matter, if, you know, if, if we can travel, we travel to to see family and then my wife's from portugal so we have to travel there as well to see family so i know those two countries very well but other than that i've been to all the SATA countries uh in the east i've only been to malaysia and singapore and spent one night in thailand i've been to america on two separate occasions on to canada on two separate occasions and we're in Switzerland three times. So not even 12 countries. Yeah, less than 10, it appears. Well, as long as you've traveled, uh, Ramon, I always say to people, you know, even if in, in our own country, a lot of people don't leave the borders, but at least they travel. They try and experience new destinations, and that's what it's all about. So I have to ask this question, and I'm asking it to all the people on stream. If you can say to me what type of traveler you are, are you a backpacker? Are you a package tourist or are you like our good friend, Dr. Jonathan with a hotel playboy? Uh, it, it really does depend. So hotel playboy, but for the most part, however, if I'm in a place, I don't know, I don't do tours in that place unless I really don't know anything. My perfect travel experience is okay. Maybe staying at a hotel will now uh, Airbnb and just actually walking around that neighborhood or that city, having a drink with locals or trying to be, trying to see how the locals live because that's the essence of travel. There's no, I mean, every yeah. Hilton hotel in the world is the same, right? Every yeah. hotel bar is the same. Like who cares about that? You, the problem with globalization is everything becomes much of the sameness. So I try to eat the local food, uh, do things the local people do. And uh, that is a far better experience to me, for me than staying in a hotel and doing like tourist trap things. Ramon, uh, while trotting over the globe, um, tell us some, a bit of stories or things that you is experienced and uh, to give our fellow listeners a bit of a more idea of, of some maybe trouble that you've been in or hairy situations that changed your view or had an, different gave you a different perspective of of how it was prior to your traveling uh that's a little bit difficult so first of all when you do travel uh especially from south africa you realize how insignificant we are as south africans generally so i think we have a bit of a, a an ego on the african continent which i think is 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 fine but once you travel to countries that are not in Africa at all, who don't even know South Africa exists as a nation, we are far behind on various other things, um, namely cultural things, namely technological things, especially if you go to America, I mean, and Canada. The amount of things you can do as a tourist and, and they make it so easy for you is actually very, very good. But also, if you travel to, I went to Mozambique during the course of last year. I went to Shai Shai for a week uh, at a friend's place. <laughs> During our time there, it actually rained for 48 hours and we couldn't actually drive back until the flooding subsided because the roads flooded 
uh, to about one and a half meters deep. And in my trusty Subaru, you couldn't get past that. So we actually had to wait uh, a day or two to come back home due to uh, the flooding and the lack of road infrastructure over there. But while in Shaoshai, you meet a lot of South Africans who actually live there. <clears throat> and the one owns a bar. He used to work in Springs as a boiler maker. And then he moved to Shaoshai about 10, 15 years ago. It was very difficult because the local authorities didn't trust him as a foreigner or as something like that. And you don't own your property. You have to rent it from the, from the state. Mm. Yeah. And now he, all the local um, city officials go visit his bar. They smoke lots of stuff over there. He goes fishing <laughs> if he wants to. Uh, and uh, it seems like a very idyllic is existence, mm. if not maybe a little bit lonely. But uh, it's good yeah. to speak to South Africans who live overseas as well. Yeah, it does give you a perspective. And sometimes, you know, I've, I've seen it so many times when you meet um, South Africans, they give you a bit more of a perspective um, out of our viewpoint on how to travel in that country. Um, <clears throat> in where we meet a we met a guy at the DMZ bar and he spoke fluent Afrikaans and, you know, he explained a lot of things around the DMZ for us. And in the end, we ended up during the hottest top part of the day, just enjoying, uh, you know, having conversation at the DMZ bar with him. And um, yeah, as you say, but do tell me about Malaysia or where you've <clears throat> been, you were in Singapore. And as you said, one night in Thailand, uh, hopefully it's not like uh, the song from Murray, one night in Bangkok. And no, no. And so I went with my father on a on a on a, a work trip with him. Mm -hmm. I was actually on school holidays. I think I was in grade eleven or grade ten. So he said, "Okay, I'm going four or five, six days. Just come along to, to Malaysia." And I've never been to Malaysia, so I said, "Sure, why not?" So we go, but we actually go not to anywhere nice. We go to Penang. So Penang is right in the north, and it's also like a little island, in fact. And what you have in Penang is a, a grey brown sea. Lot, a lot of musk or fog or something. So there's no clear skies and you have quite rubbish infrastructure and these sort of high rise buildings where all the Europeans stay in that are air conditioned because they're too hot and humid. So it really felt like a, a, an expat experience for the most part until we drove to the other side of Penang. And there you see like, you know, rats on a skewer on the side of the road or things like that and so that's where we ate yeah? we actually went to the traditional side of the island which is about a 45 minute drive to get away from the malls and all that nonsense and see you know, real people living as as they do and that was yeah it was interesting i don't know if i would go back if i'm honest i was actually disappointed i, need, I haven't been to kuala lumpur any of the major sites in malaysia but while we were there we said okay let's go to thailand for a night or for a day so we went to and i can't remember the name i think it's hung thai or something to that effect it's on the border to the south with malaysia yeah and the only reason we went was just to get out of penang because penang was boring us to bits my father's work took two days we were there for seven and uh after a while eating crickets and rats you get a bit bored so <laughs> thailand was around the corner it was about a three hour drive uh, so you go to Hang Thai, and then it was just a different sensory experience entirely. There's much more energy. Um, and we booked into a hotel. You see ladies of the night coming in and out of the hotel, being picked up by a scooter or tuk-tuk. Um, and then I went to a, a traditional Thai barber. So Hang Thai is a, a, not a nice town. It's not a fancy cosmopolitan area. <clears throat> but the barber's wearing a, his... Um, his shirt and his uh, pressed slacks. And uh, there's a picture, there's pictures of naked women all over the wall, except for the one wall where there's a picture of the king uh, to, yeah. to show reverence. Yeah. And then while I was having a haircut, a, a woman tried to come in and they refused her entry. And she swore and then she left. But they were speaking Thai, I didn't understand the thing. So I thought it's weird, women aren't allowed in a barber. But it's, not, it's not that strange, but it was a little bit strange coming from here where we all about inclusivity mm. and then we went to a massage but we went to the wrong place it was actually a brothel so we left because <laughs> i said who do you want as your masseuse i'm like no 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 like a real a real massage not, not your funny massage 
And then my father picked my masseuse for me, and she was the biggest, the biggest Han Chinese woman I've ever seen in my life. She was bigger than me and, and twice my my width. And she was very strong and she almost broke me. Proper massage, though, no hanky panky stuff. Yeah. Um, and then, yeah, we, then we left. So Thailand was more memorable in 24 hours than like six days of Malaysia. You know, interesting enough, Ramon, as you say, in Thailand, how many, uh, so many times I've heard that happen to people. And uh, with me and Linnell also, you know, we did some traveling around Phuket and Bangkok as well. To, uh, we were there twice. And um, yeah, if you don't know the rules of the game, you might end up, <laughs> in a brothel as you said that's why they say keep to the spas and you know to the <laughs> and stay away from those ones that has nice neon signs on the street um Ramon, quite an interesting question i want to ask you about this um malaysia being more dominant muslim and thailand being more buddhist out of your experience now in both countries i haven't been to malaysia um do you think that the muslim uh, and this is no offense to nobody, please. Um, but do you think that religion plays a bigger role in the structure? Because what I've heard people saying is that Malaysia's society is much more structured, much more rigid, much more conservative versus to Thailand where they, in, as you say, in a barbershop, there's pictures of a naked woman. What was your experience in that sense? Uh, I know it's a very difficult topic or a very dangerous topic that I'm t touching on, but I've experienced in countries where, where there's predominantly Muslim, I fit in more, more, uh, much better because of the conservative co uh, structure of, of, of that country. What was your experience? So in, in Penang, which is the area of Malaysia we were in, it wasn't obvious to me. It was actually the, the people's um, ethnicity was not... Uh, dark. It was more light. It was, it was more Chinese, Han Chinese, yeah. Thai um, disposition. So I didn't feel any form of uh, forbearing that this was a Muslim area. I've been, I've been to uh, another country I missed was Dubai and Egypt. So I've been to Muslim areas or Muslim countries, overtly Muslim. Dubai. I went there during Ramadan. Worst, worst uh, decision ever made. And there you really feel it. Uh, there you really feel it in terms of. The way people dress, the way how 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 much of a stickler they are for rules. Uh, whereas in Malaysia, does Penang is more of a backwards, not backwards, but it's a more rural place. I don't think they care too much, but you do sense more vibrancy once we went over to Thailand for for that twenty four hours. Um, the Thai are Buddhist, and I don't know if there's such thing as sin in Buddhism. I could be wrong. I don't know Buddhism very well, but there is there's a version of reincarnation and you have to try and yeah. be at peace with yourself and all that sort of yes. stuff. And yeah. I think that I'm not a Buddhist uh, by any means, but that appears from the outside to be a little bit more free with one's mm. body and one's life than, than in the Islamic tradition. Um, yeah. I'm not saying one is better than the other. That's just what I saw from the outside. Mm. No, it's quite true. As you say, Buddhist is more, uh, your reincarnation is uh, much more important. I think if I'm wrong, then I'm wrong. But um, yeah, peace, harmony, <clears throat> and love, basically, are the three rules. What's in between? A lot of things. Uh, yes, Kat, you've just said it now. No shame or guilt uh, in Buddhism. That's that's exactly, okay, it's all right. Now, Ramon, you've said that you've traveled France to France and Portugal. Um, what would you say for first time European travelers, the do's and don'ts? For, for Europe generally or those two countries? Uh, well, let's say France or uh, Portugal because I've, I've, my experience was do's and don'ts sort of fit into most of Europe in but not all. Germany has their own way of thinking. But anyways, uh, okay, let's uh, talk about France and Portugal. All right. So for France, I mean, there's not many don'ts, as uh, if, yeah. if I'm really yeah. honest, especially in Paris, everything seems to go. I mean, I've seen people defecate on the pavement. Not that that's usual by any means, please. I'm not saying that's what people do there. Uh, but it's, it's, it's so much, well, 
excuse me, that's my heritage you talking about, Herman. <laughs> <laughs> a, a, a little bit of um, a little bit of difference, please. <laughs> I think the biggest problem for South Africans is understanding that these countries are where you walk and you take public transport. For most travelers from South Africa, they don't understand any of that. So the, the risk of violence is low. The risk of pickpocketing, et cetera, is very, very high. Um, but other than that, I mean, just oh, for just one thing, what, what I dislike, if I'm a tourist, I don't want to look like a tourist. Mm. like try sort of try melt into i mean you can't help it if you're a different ethnicity or race from where you are like if you mm. you'll always be a tourist in mozambique right because you're white or i'm white mm. but in france i mean please don't dress in cargo shorts and a polo shirt because that's what that's not what people dress like uh people care about uh satoro mm. elegance and 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 this is a safety issue too because mm. if you look like a tourist that's where you get harassed by hawkers or that's where you get harassed by pickpockets and that's where you get if i may say uh less service from restaurants than if you were dressed normally for that culture thankfully i'm french so people think i'm french and i am french so when i go there it's fine but i've seen especially english people especially americans walking around with moon bags and cargo shorts and stuff and uh, people don't don't like that too much. Like you, you stand out like a sore thumb. Mm. Uh, especially khaki clothes, uh, khaki shirt, and khaki short pants. Um, but funny enough, as you say, every, the moment they sort of, as you say, that's quite true. In as you say, in certain restaurants, they sort of, you know, there's less service. But the moment you explain to them, listen, yeah, um, I'm not English. I'm not European. I'm from South Africa. Their attitude changes towards us for some reason they are not that hateful towards us as as they as you said towards um the uh, americans or some of the especially their neighbors the english yeah just speak afrikaans if you can and they'll treat you perfectly fine they're, they're not they're not mm. disrespectful or rude i think that age is gone they used to be rude mm. in france but i found mm. far fewer instances mm. of rudeness in the past yeah. 10 years or so. Mm. But if you speak Afrikaans, they think you're Dutch or German or something. And yeah. They treat you a bit better. That's true. That's true. Um, <clears throat> Ramon, if I may ask, um, Portugal, as you said, you have uh, family as there as well. What would you suggest? Because f I think for most of it, we understand the French culture much more because we have a lot of French influence in South Africa. Um, Although we have a lot of Portuguese people in South Africa, for some reason, most of the communities in South Africa didn't or did not get involved in the Portuguese uh, culture. What would you say for us uh, that's a no-go when you visit Portugal? You know, what would be a cultural inappropriation, inappropriate to do? In Portugal, it's that's difficult to say. I know Lisbon well. I know the southern coast of Portugal well, around Cascais, uh, Carcavelos, uh, all those areas. It's it's very much like a Mediterranean climate. Uh, the Portuguese people are pragmatic, conservative people. But, I mean, you do have those people with tattoos and weird hair and all that sort of stuff. It's very much just behave as you would in any civilized, you know, civilization, and you should get along well. Um, I mean, I think the taboos are rather obvious. Try not to be rude. Um, don't defecate on the street. <laughs> and um, yeah, just treat people like human beings. And I think those sort of characteristics will do you well anywhere in the world, if I'm honest. But if you're just a terrible human being, everywhere will be a problem. But if you're a normal human being who understands decorum and behavior, you'll get along in many areas, except maybe Japan, because they are they have much higher standards than we do, which, which I haven't yeah. been to yet, but I want to visit one day. Well, that's one I must honestly say from my experience in China, uh, when it comes to decorum and rule, uh, certain rules, when it comes to cultural rules, uh, if you don't observe those rules, and I know the Japanese are quite the same, uh, it is within a few minutes that you've lost the respect of those people. And uh, yeah. So, Ramon, America, let's move on. We've started on the far side of the globe with you, and then we're, now we're taking the flight to America and Canada. Uh, I would not say 
give my personal opinion about Canadians, but um, let's leave it there. I don't want to talk about Canada. <laughs> um, where were you visiting when you went to the United States? And what was the one thing that stood out for you? Uh, in 2000, I went to Orlando, uh, to Disney World um, at the time. Uh, very, um, yeah, very interesting visit. I mean, I was 13, so if you don't, yeah. you just look at the rides and bloody Snoopy and, well, no, not Snoopy, that's the wrong bloody company, but <laughs> uh, you know, it's just the size, especially in Orlando, just the size of everything is, is absolutely immense. The size of food, the size of people, the size of rides. The amount of money spent to make people have 30 seconds of sheer terror is amazes me. It's like the GDP of South Africa is used to run Disney World. I don't know. But Probably. in Disney World, I don't know how many hectares it is, but I think it's a few thousand. So once you get in Disney World, you don't go out. The hotel's there. The buses are there. The different Disney World parks are there. And uh, the biggest problem for me was when paying for something, they say, okay, that's $1 and a quarter. And I'm like, what the hell is a quarter? Mm. And then like, they look at you like you're dumb. <laughs> so then you find, out, then you find out it's 25 cents is a quarter. Yeah. And then a, then there was another one, 10, 10 not a penny. Mm. It's $2 and a penny. I'm like, what the hell? Is yeah. that's 10 cents is a penny. So that sort of stuff. But I found, I found um, Americans to be actually quite nice people. Uh, very... Mm gregarious outgoing yeah. far too outgoing for my liking but never you never feel like you know weird areas just the scale of things for a south african was very very different uh, so that was the first one and then the second one in 2012 i went to new york uh, in winter a it's very cold much colder than you believe i had to buy clothes there to actually be able to walk around and once in new york i don't know if you've been had a but the assault on the senses that place is amazing. Yeah, I've I've heard a few people describe it. They say if you've experienced Bangkok at night, it's basically the same experience that is what you have in 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 uh, New York. Uh, I just want to do greet all our fellow people in the chat. Uh, we have JCS from Cape Town. I see he's here. We have Rebellious Roof. We've got Cat, and then and Andrea Cooper, who is the first timer that I've seen on my chat. Welcome, Andrea. And Darren Brunt, yes, Darren, I'm hiding away up behind Farmer's Travels. I don't want to let everybody know uh, exactly where I am. Um, welcome on the channel. Um, I3, 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 can't pronounce that one. Um, welcome, everybody, uh, to the channel. And, uh, yeah, Kat uh, sort of busted me. I'm doing the east to west on purpose because uh, we have an east to west conflict going on between the east and the west. Um, you were talking about, uh, so you said Orlando and New York. Um, any other, before we fly back to Johannesburg to assault our souls, <laughs> um, any other thing that you would say about America that you found maybe interesting or great? What makes America great again? Uh, well, what makes America great? And this is where you feel it in, in New York City. So I stayed on, on Manhattan in Midtown uh, at, a, at a crappy apartment, but you had everything you need in 20 square meters, including a kitchen and a bathroom. Uh, so, so that was pretty good. What is interesting is just the ruthless, ruthless, ruthless customer first mentality. Uh, it felt like I was in New Delhi. I could haggle on everything. <laughs> <laughs> on everything uh, in the most expensive luggage shop to the hawk on the street selling bagels like yeah. you could haggle like you can't believe and just yeah. the, the 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 culmination yeah. of that cutthroat competition across the entire manhattan i stayed yeah. for two weeks in manhattan i was supposed to go to brooklyn harlem queens and see yeah. everything else i just didn't have the time because there was so much to do in in manhattan but that Basically, as you get into, you fly into JFK, you take two hours to get through the bloody border control thing because they're very slow. You get into this train and then you go to. Did you, did you just say the border control in America is slow? Can they beat a Watambo on a good day? Oh, believe me, they can. Oh, believe me, they can. No. And not because they're inefficient, because they question everyone. Everyone. <laughs> um, absolutely everyone. Uh, so you take the train 
from the, the 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 airport to Penn Station, which is the main station from New York. But I was craving a cigarette so badly at the time. I got off at Jamaica Street, which was in mm. Brooklyn, I think. Mm. Got out of the train, went down to the street and started smoking because I needed it very badly. Mm. And that's when you s- see the steam and you smell mm. the rubbish and you smell the car fumes and you're like, mm. like yeah, you're really here. Like this is where the movies mm. are filmed and you're right here. Mm. Got back onto the train, then went to Penn Station, which is the main station. Mm. And the thing about New York, there's only one nice station in the whole, which is Central, uh, what's it called? Central, whatever, Grand Central. Yeah. Grand Central. All other, all other train stations are terrible. But you get out onto 34th Street, I think it's 34th Street, and there you got yeah. the the amount of noise, activity, and energy you get just by stepping out onto the street is absolutely phenomenal. I don't think I'll ever forget that. And worst of all, there was a queue of taxis in front of me and I, I thought they were parked, not waiting. Yeah. So I put my hand up and another taxi from somewhere else came and picked me up. Yeah. And the other guy in the taxis in the queue started shouting at me and I just got to oh. a tourist. I was like, I didn't know there was a line. I thought you were parked off uh, like they do in South Africa. But uh, <laughs> yeah, great. everyone should go to New York at least once in their life. It will... Yeah, if you feel like uh, you, if you feel alone in the world, go live in New York or go visit. I the think I think you you you're sort of referring to that Baz Luhrmann song. You stay in New York before it, I think you become too hard. Move to uh, I think Baz Luhrmann did his first song on that one, if I, if I can remember correctly. So Ramon, back to South Africa, back to Joburg. You said you traveled all the Sadiq, uh countries. Um, excluding Zimbabwe. If you could pick one country, except our own country at this current stage, that you would gladly move to, we, uh, not due to the nat- uh, the natural um, the natir, sorry, um, but the people, the vibe, the vibrance, which country would you choose? Uh, not just the country, but the town, uh, Swakobmund in Namibia. Uh, we went there Four years ago now, we took we flew to Vintuk, hired a land cruiser, and drove around the center of Namibia over the course of a week. Stayed in four places, uh, and then Swakopmund was the last three days. Swakopmund is German Gothic with a uh, Kalahari Desert, uh, Valfus Bay is just down the road, and in between the two towns, there's nothing but sand, nothing at all. What is nice about Swakopmund? Uh, there are great German pubs, and also it's very, it's quite orderly, in fact. So I remember parking the car, and a car guard comes up, and this is 2015, 2016. He's wearing an official uniform uh, with uh, with his name, a, a real, real car guard, uh, officially licensed uh, with the tags, with everything. And he says, okay, sir, thank you for parking. That you do know it will be $10 or whatever, $5 million per hour. And um, everything just worked. Lovely antique stores. It felt like a little seaside town that's a bit like the Cape, but one fifth of the size. Uh, so, yeah, Swakopmund is a place I would certainly live in. You know, it's strange uh, that a lot of people who have been there uh, say exactly the same, you know, Ramon. It is one of those towns that just have some magic to it. I think it's probably. Isn't it a way, uh, because of our cultural heritage from Europe, Europe, because it feels to me sometimes like it's a little bit of Europe just put down there, you know, sort of to remind us where we come from. Yeah, in some ways, in some ways, especially some of the architecture in the old towns. I mean, the hotel where I think Angelina Jolie had um, had her baby there somewhere, if I don't, if I remember correctly. I mean, that hotel is like a Gothic German castle. And it's been there for eight yeah. or nineteen years. Yeah. And a- another reason why I like it there, we went to Volfus Bay. Volfus Bay is very Afrikaans. I was surprised yeah. to see Afrikaners uh, in in Namibia. Not not because I didn't think they would exist, but they were not South African. But they sounded exactly like South African. But they've been in Namibia Dor- for three generations. Those were the old Dorschland trackers. That's right. That's right. And and that man, he runs a tourism thing. So he took us on his land cruiser and we did the dunes, which was very fun. And then we went to all of the filming locations for Bad Backs Fury Road, which was a great film, which I loved greatly. Yeah. And he showed us exactly 
where they filmed. So we were driving along and there's nothing like you could, you could, you could detonate a nuke and no one would know. It's just so desolate. But meanwhile, it's 10 Ks from, from Volvo's Bay. But if you just look around, you would think you in the middle of the Sahara desert with no civilization. You know, Roman, it's interesting that I, I don't think we realize um, as South Africans or people living in Southern Africa, how many famous movies have been shot in our country, you know, um, have been shot in Namibia, Botswana, uh, in Mozambique. Um, I don't know if you know from Blood Diamonds, there was a famous, the famous shootout that happened in the city. Very few people know that that was shot at the train station in Maputo, that specific scene. Really? <clears throat> yeah, they dressed. The, they totally changed the whole location, and um, that was quite interesting. That that is a specific scene where he sort of walks out of the hotel, and where the shootout starts, uh, where the Caprius walks out. That is the train station in Maputo, and I'm look, we're looking at this and it's like, hey, I've been there. That's the train station in Maputo. So yeah, um, it's that time of the night, ladies and gentlemen, where we kick off. Our first king and queen of the hill, not to be gender biased here. Um, tonight I'm launching the first king of or queen of the hill because there's a few ladies also on this uh, tube that's with us on YouTube. And my whole idea is to see out of five questions in the end of a few streams, who will take the trophy home as the one that has the most knowledge. And I've prepared a few questions for a month tonight um, to see. But guys, please, as we sit here, guys, really, I'm begging you tonight. I'm begging. Please use the zapper. I've set it up. I haven't had a zap. So I just want to see if everything works. So if you're, any one of you will be so kind. You've been giving all your money, hopefully, at 5 o'clock. Not all your money to Ramon. Even a 69 cent would be acceptable. But um, anyways... Well, Ramon is getting his Google set up there. Can, can I just see if your zapper works? Hold on. I'm just, okay. We need to make sure. We need to make sure. <laughs> so, so I, can, I can tell the people that it works. <laughs> you, can right, give your, my, you can give my 69 cents back if you if you want to. Well, with a, with a lot more interest, my friend. Let's see. There Thank you, go. you Ramon. Works. And Darren Brunt. Thank you for your contribution to my channel i appreciate it immensely and it works <laughs> yeah well it's my first official zaps that works um all right ramon are you ready to rumble for the title of king of the hill or yeah you know, we can't say queen of the hill because uh that would be gender appropriation anyways are you ready I, yes all right hopefully okay i don't myself. yeah as a lawyer, you should know this first question. In which country and city was the first war crimes tribunal held? And hang on, second question, second part of the question. And why is it important to us today? Are you talking about the Nuremberg trials in Germany? Y yes. That and why one? is yeah, why is it important today for us? Uh, well, I think the ICC was based on, on the legislative precedent from there. And now today, South Africa wants to get out of the ICC. Unfortunately, yes, you're correct. And unfortunately, yes, we want to leave the International Criminal Court. All right. I get three points, You'll, right? That was three uh, questions. Right? I'll give you two. <laughs> in our uh, second question, in which country did the Boxer Rebellion occur? And why? Is it significant to that country today? I've heard of the Boxer Rebellion was or why it happened. I'm afraid I pass. I agree with you. Okay. It's an Asian country. I'll give you, let's give him a lifeline, ladies and gentlemen. Let's see in the chats. Let's give him a lifeline. Let's see who's the fastest on this Google. Come on, guys. Give him a lifeline there. China. Right. It was China. You're right. No, Marek is not Spain. <laughs> <laughs> Marek is not Spain. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I don't know why it happened, though. Um, okay. All right. The reason why the Boxer Rebellion happened uh, was that it was anti... Uh, they were against the emperor and the whole 
idea of being ruled by an emperor. It was anti-foreigner and it was anti-Christian. Now, pertaining to my second question, why was the Boxer um, Rebellion significant to China today? I suppose you're talking about the Uyghurs. No. The ethnic of the Uyghurs, or are you talking about Hong Kong? No, no. Why it's pertaining today to quite interesting is that it, that set the grounds for Mao and his mm. crew in the late uh, 1960s to start taking control of China. The Boxer Rebellion was the start of what yeah. to to take China to where it is today. Um, and, and, quite that's why, and that's why I'm anti-revolutionary because the Weimar Republic created the Nazi Party. Boxer Rebellion yeah. creates the CCP. A lot yes. of revolutions, you don't see the outcomes within the next year or two. You see it ten, a decade or two down the line. And it's, it's never better, as far as I'm aware, except for maybe one, the American one, it's never better afterwards than it was before. So people must just be wary when they want a revolution at all costs. It's, uh, yeah. Uh, the who said on somebody on chat said anti-imperialist thank you for correcting me i appreciate it uh there we go elizabeth said it um thank you for the lack of a better word for me right ramon your third question where is the driest place on earth uh isn't it death valley at last rain 400 years ago mm, no not really I had a Guinness Book of Records of 1998, and it was certainly Death Valley. Okay, let's say the world, the the recognised, most commonly recognised. Let's put the, those words in the most commonly recognised driest place on Earth. Are you talking about Antarctica? Mm. Or are you talking about a desert? With, I know. We're talking about the desert. It's, it's so let's say it's south of it is in the southern continent of America. The southern it's a somewhere in South America. Well, it's a lot of hints, but I don't know what desert there is in South America. <laughs> okay, <laughs> that's the Atacama Desert, it's known as the driest place or driest desert on earth. Uh, thank you. So, quite interesting. Um, all right, question four. What is the most, there was a famous poem written uh, about the battle um, of Balaclava during the Crimean War. What's the name of that poem? Arman, what the hell kind of questions are these? <laughs> you, you make me look like I'm dumb. Uh, no. I'm a, the battle of Balaclava. Yeah, the battle of Balaclava in the Crimean War. It was a famous charge of a British, that was the British against the Russians during the Crimean War in 19, I think it's 1900, of early, no, 1890. And there was a famous battle cry or poem? No, a poem written by an English poet. And what's the name of that? Oh, an English poet. Um, Rudyard Kipling? No, it's not Kipling. Well, you know, like Vietnam. The, the poem's name is The Charge of the Light Brigade. Yeah. And it the is, author is? Sir Thomas. Oh, for, for the love of me now, I've forgotten. It's Sir Thomas. Ah, uh, yes. You yes. see. Uh, <laughs> hang on. That's, hang on, hang on. Uh, guys, I'm just going to say uh, I actually had, it's one of, it's a very interesting um um, it, because it's one of the few literature that was captured um, about the Crimea. It was written by Sir Lord Tennyson, Alfred Tennyson. That's correct. That's not Thomas. That's Lord yeah. Alfred Tennyson. Yeah, and you should get Elizabeth. Oh, she can Google Sharp Sharp. Yeah. Um, this is quite interesting is why it's one of the few events that actually captured uh, the uh, the Crimean War Uh during with Russia and um, what we will know today is uh, Ukraine um, yeah. and the British involvement in Ukraine. Funny enough, during the Boxer Revolution uh, Rebellion, uh, America had a huge influence in crushing the Boxer um, Rebellion in China as well. 
Interesting. It's a little bit like the Germans in World War One funding the Bolsheviks in Russia yeah. Yeah. to overthrow the Tsar so that the Russian could Russian threat could go away in World War One. Mm. Yeah, didn't think that went through in World War Two, now did they? Came no, back to they didn't. Them. Yeah. Now on own butter soil in Africa, mm -hmm. the only country that was never colonized and who was its leader during that time? Um, the country, if I remember, I always, I always mix up the two, but I think it's Ethiopia. Yeah, you're right. It's Ethiopia. And Emperor, something with an H. Um, you're right, Emperor with an H. Hali, Haley. Um, I don't yeah. remember his name fully. Uh, something with an I'll, H. <clears throat> I'll give you a Hail uh, Selassie. Hail Selassie, I'll, yes. I'll give you I'll give you that. So Half a point. and the on the final tally for question one, you have two points. Um question two. Uh you were quite yeah, I'll give you China because you said China. I'll give you that one. Um zero for the driest place on earth. And unfortunately, zero for question four. So out of a total, I'll give you one, two, three, four, five out of eight not too bad hey that's a boss it's more than okay so guys on the stream uh whoever i'm contacting next to appear on the screen uh you have five out of eight to beat for king or queen of the hill hopefully we'll do this uh much more um yeah you know ramon this this is uh quite interesting you know we sometimes think that uh especially because we've been to different countries you know uh uh, I've sometimes get the notion that people think they know a lot, you know, um, about a country. Now I've been, I've personally have been floored uh, so many times, you know, being to a country and then people ask me questions about that country. And then you're like, uh, I don't know, you know, and then sometimes it's a common knowledge. All right. Um, so don't feel too bad. I've been floored a well a few times. Um, Ruth took me out badly. Uh, on on the stream the other night, you know. So, um, but, Ramon, I think, it, yeah, if I may. I think an important consideration for travel should one be able to do so, of course. Um, but I think just traveling within South Africa and to go to all nine provinces is, is worthy in and of itself. But the more you travel, I don't know about you, Herman. The more I travel, the more humble one becomes, yes. essentially, because there's just so much you don't know. And I know that many people that we consider great who are much more knowledgeable than we are, who are polyglots, you know, he can speak about maths, mm. physics, history, philosophy, mm. and religion, mm. like someone like Jordan Peterson or something to that degree. No. They are often the most humble people you find because for someone like me, when I travel, I get humbled because of things that I don't know. And then you actually realize how much you don't know. And I think the more you realize you don't know something, or how much you don't know, the more humble uh, you become as an individual. So I think, for example, I know the ANC well. But that's one political party in a third world country that no one really cares about. Like that's not <laughs> that's not an accomplishment. I mean, it's an accomplishment yeah. for for my purposes, of course, but not mm. <clears throat> in, in the in the echoes of history. No one's going to remember me because I know the yeah. ANC well, right? Yeah. And um, so, yeah, just become humble when you travel. I think that's the important part. You know, I think, Ramon, that is the major, from the beginning of starting my channel, is the sort of the message that I wanted to tell people is if you travel is, uh, I've seen so many times, me included, uh, uh, I've made so many times, I've made the mistake of trying to be superior and it only bites you. You know, people will go back. They don't say, Herman Ruiz or Ramon Kabanek is a, big a-hole they are saying south africans are ale you know that's an old saying where we say uh, yanks are loud and um they are irritating you know they're not i've met a lot of americans that are really truly brilliant people but the overall idea <clears throat> i made the joke about canadians early on not all canadians are bad i've just had a bad experience with a few of them um and i think if we can strive to learn and get a bit of more local knowledge, um, 
about your area that you're visiting. How many times don't we, in South Africa, <clears throat> we stumble into an area or a town and we actually know nothing about the history of that town. And, you know, um, Dolstrom, for instance, how many people have been to Dolstrom, but they, do, they actually know the history of Dolstrom? I don't. I've been there. Yeah, I know nothing about Dol. I actually don't even like it right now, if I'm <laughs> if I'm honest. But yes, I know nothing about Dolstrom uh, at all. I don't like places where there's art galleries. I always find that very mm. pretentious. <laughs> you know, you know, Ramon. The first time I realized in South Africa, you know, uh, we went to Vakastrum, you know, and we were driving around Dundee and those areas, and suddenly it hit me for the first time that we were actually traveling. Uh, at that stage, uh, our son was three months old. And, you know, f you actually forced with a three, uh, three months old baby to actually stop. And, you know, let's say you can't do just what you want to do. And for the first time, I realized that I didn't know the history of most of the towns we visited. And I don't know about you if you've had that similar, that type of experience. Uh, yeah, no, it happened, it happened very, very often. So, th I mean, thankfully, uh, smartphones and Google, you can sort of find out what you want um, on, on the way. But um, I think I've driven through quite a few towns where there were, like, you know, monuments to, to battles of the past that I had no yeah. idea actually happened. Um, mm. I went, I drove past Philippoulos, and mm. I didn't know that, but, but my stepmother's family is from Philippoulos and they had a farm there until the 1930s which was thousands and thousands and mm -hmm. thousands of, hec of, of hectares yep. at the time <laughs> and, I, and I told her my stepmother at the time that you know we drove through and she's like oh Philippoulos that's where I come from we got a long tradition um, long tradition of, of the family the Van Rensburgs yeah. Um, yeah. living in Philippoulos and, um, yeah, and I didn't know I mean it would have been nice to go into the town and and see what it was like. But there's a lot of these towns, especially I find in the Northern Cape and in the Southern Free State, Zastron, Calvinia, the R, Richmond. I mean, you got buildings there from the 1800s yeah. that are still in occupancy today. Those buildings are older than Joburg as a city. Yeah, yeah, yeah that is. That's true. You so need, you need to know those, what they're from. And it's kind of interesting. Um, I was going to throw a bit of a curveball here. Very few people will know this, but did you know that Parliament is actually located on the property that's owned by Freemasons in South Africa? I knew it. That's the problem we have. The, uh, uh, you're not. Uh, you're not going to disc my brothers. That's a personal I the problem Freemasons, I'll have. I thought so what's the difference between the Freemasons and the Illuminati, Herman? We need to know. I thought this was a democratic well, country. Well, let's, the Freemasons let's, control let's, take, let's take that onto your stream, and uh, we'll have a discussion about that on your stream. This is a travel stream. Okay, guys, Ramon, on the end of the last 10 minutes of the stream, uh, previously, uh, we, me and you have been exchanging a bit of idea on doing a fundraiser. And... Um, have you given thought about the idea? I mean, are we allowed to disclose what that idea is? Yeah, because I think uh, it's time for our viewers on all the channels to start knowing what we're planning, if it's okay with you. And let's see if mm. we can get a vote on this, if they will be willing to to get on board with this. And let's see if we can get some, some sponsors, because, oh boy, I want to do this. When the borders open, I want to do this. So basically the idea is to have a, a convoy or was it a race? It was a race. I basically a race, convoy, crazy, just, yeah. From, from Joburg, South Africa to, where was it? Durban to Dar es Salaam, yeah. Durban to Dar es Salaam, yeah. And then uh, people sponsor and support that convoy yeah. slash race. And then we, yeah. and then we donate the, the proceeds thereof. Yeah. Uh, to an orphanage. Yeah, that's correct. Guys, and this is an idea that we've been tinkering about. Uh, haven't We haven't got a lot of track on it yet uh, because of the lockdown. Um, I've mentioned it as I said to Germ and those guys, and all of them are on board. So, guys, while we're in the um, chat here, uh, please give a thumbs up or a yes or no. Do you think it will be a great idea 
to put Ramon, me, Jim, and a few other of the guys on <laughs> in a race that's being filmed uh, to Dar es Salaam and to see, watch our craziness, and also to then uh, get some fundraisers for our orphanages. And why I'm saying orphanages, there's a lot of, I think, orphanages will, that will be suffering after this COVID and with the economic uh, crash in the economy. These uh, orphanages, some of the orphanages are definitely going to be hurt badly because a lot of them are dependent on donations. Yeah, as long as I can drive with Mareka and Jim doesn't drive with us, I'm in. That man can talk the back leg of, of a donkey off. I I've been met hunting him on with Wednesday. Him. <laughs> I've been hunting with him. I've done a lot of things with Jim, and my goodness gracious, you can tell him to keep quiet. He doesn't. Uh, he doesn't get the social cues, <laughs> so he has to be uh -huh. rude to him. Uh, but if Mareka, if Mareka wants to come, I'm very happy for her to to be uh, uh, shotgun. Mareka, Mareka and she will can, be there, and she can uh, test drive my Subaru Turbo, best car in the world. Yeah, so it seems like Mareka and, R and Ruf are at it. They're already into the <laughs> into the tour already. Um, <laughs> Elizabeth saying, uh, <laughs> just give Jim some crayons. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> hopefully Jim is not on the channel. I think he, <laughs> Leah, well, hopefully. Um, so yeah, uh, seems like a few guys, they're reacting quite slow for 33 viewers. Um, Come on, guys. Let's see. Mareka's asking uh, if she's asking you, Ramon, I drive the Subaru. There we go. Mareka, you can drive my Subaru whenever you want. After it's tuned. <laughs> after it's tuned. I need to get it tuned first. But yes, uh, it, it will be the best car on the way. Yeah. Though I know so, Herman drives a Bucky and those things last forever. So it could be tight. Mm. Yeah, it depends. If I fall asleep behind the wheel, might happen. So, guys, what I'm going to do later on uh, when things are a bit more settled, I think, after the craziness of the lockdown within a few weeks, I'm going to get Germ on as well, get uh, Mareka and uh, Roof, because Roof was one of actually one of the uh, I found that's actually she pushed me to continue with the idea. Um, and get Gideon on, because on, uh, and uh, Jonathan, our, our great house doctor, because we might need a not a medic, but we might need a doctor while we're on the trip. Yeah, the problem is Jonathan. He, he drives a BMW, so that thing's not going to last two hundred kilometers. Uh, we'll 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 I'll pop him in the back of the bucky. Um, so what I'll try and do is I can get uh, everybody on my stream, and uh, yeah. We'll see how it goes and how it feels, but it will probably be uh, Ramon next year around February, March. Oh, good grief! That's in my production time. Yeah, one hopes. Um, well, as, yeah. as a ten-day trip, if I remember correctly, and uh, yeah, it, it depends. It's about seven hmm. days hard drive if we drive non-stop and literally just stop and sleep uh, to Dar es Salaam. Um, as I said to you earlier, my idea is that we must do it in a specific time limit and that we must meet our families at the airport in Zanzibar. So if you miss the deadline to get onto the ferry from Dar es Salaam to uh, Zanzibar, you're missing your arrival time of your family. So that's going to be, I think, a bit of an interesting twist to it. Yeah. And then, yes, of course, we have to drive back. Um, we have to still cut, which was, right. uh, um, so it will be around roughly, let's say, 21 days. Well, knowing my family, they'll just sabotage my car, so I'll never get there. I'll take the holiday <laughs> by themselves. Um, that sort of was, was my idea to do with the rest of your crew, you know, is to, oh. you know, blow down your tires while we're on the way. You see, we're already talking about what we're going to do, and we haven't started our cars yet. Um, yeah, so it seems like the guys in the chat are mocking us about this idea. Um, get it, Marek. Uh, Elizabeth says, uh, we must get a truck and put everybody inside. No, no, that's not going to work. We might up end, up, end up in the end in a loony bin when we arrive there. <laughs> yeah, there you go. We can, yeah, we can do a Mad Max style and shoot, shoot guns from the back of the truck. I think it'll be good. We can do that. <laughs> Look at Marek's... Uh, <laughs> Guys, if we're ever going to do this, good grief. 
Oh man, now I'm even looking more forward to it because I think between the bunch of us, it's going to be madness. I just wonder how much a whiskey germ will get for Mareka. Hopefully a lot because it'll be valuable. <laughs> if, if if you get like rubbish whiskey. Oy. No, knowing knowing germ, he'll settle for one shot of whiskey, as, uh, then he'll be fine. <laughs> <laughs> okay guys uh, uh roman thank you for being on the channel um as a and thank you for playing king on queen or, or queen of the hill um with me and also talking about your travel experience i think there's a lot of tips that you've given to the people uh to our people and telling them um and as you said in the end it's a humbling experience wherever you are mm -hmm. even in south africa um guys before i end the stream while everybody's on please guys go out uh, and support your local lodges uh please go and book if you can with your local bed and breakfast even if it's just for one night uh these guys ha are allowed under regulations now to be open and you are allowed to travel as a family interprovincial um although we don't care i don't care about that um please guys the tourist industry is currently in much more dire need of revival than we are in as tobacco farmers and as lawyers uh, although we all need support somewhere somehow um guys i'm i'm asking for the tourist industry and because this is a travel channel i will always rem uh, remind you guys of the importance that these guys in the hospitality industry if without them we cannot travel thanks guys good night ramon any final words from you uh, no i fully agree and uh yeah support local businesses not big ones because uh, big ones don't fight for you locals do and i know that they, they say that, uh, that you only allowed to travel in your province i heard over the weekend half of bloemfontein was in the kruger park uh, without much uh, hitch or, or or problems along the way so uh, think of it more as a guideline i mean be ready yeah. but it seems to be more of a guideline than a, a hard and fast rule because if no one can enforce a silly rule then it fails to become a rule yeah. um just on the end mareka says maybe uh she can finally buy her 1999 prado uh drive it stick and sell it in dar es salaam well mareka that's a good idea and uh it seems like we're already making plans to get underway guys i'm gonna say good night to all good night ramon uh please stay on yeah. on uh online and then uh, i'm just gonna end the stream and say good night to everybody cheers keep well guys keep safe and if you travel travel safe and thanks for everybody who used the zapper i appreciate it immensely uh that will pay my two liters of diesel that I'm going to use to drive to Mabalingwe quite shortly with my family. Cheers, everybody, and goodbye.